It's 1991 and Michael Jordan's greatness is in question. Not on an individual level, after leading the NBA in scoring in five consecutive seasons, no one doubted that MJ was the best player in the league, or at least the best scorer. But his failures in the playoffs had put his future legacy in real jeopardy. The reason is simple. There had been two teams that were always able to put him on the ropes. The Boston Celtics had eliminated the Bulls on two occasions, but luckily the advanced age of Bird's team had left them out of the group of contenders. And now it was Isaiah Thomas's Detroit Pistons who had the measure of MJ and company. They were their nemesis. And until Jordan surpassed them, he would never reach that legendary status that accompanied him during the 90s. Yes, it was 1991 and Mike was really on a mission. Let's put things into context. Chicago was unable to knock off Detroit. In the last three postseasons, the two teams had met once in the second round and twice in the Eastern Conference Finals, and the Pistons had won every series. The toughness of their play had turned the Palace of Auburn Hills into a real fortress. Detroit had not only managed to create the infamous Jordan rules that were capable of stopping the best scorer in the world, but they had proven that they worked. They had won two NBA championships and were already dreaming of the 3 P. Detroit Pistons seeking a third straight NBA title this season. We talked about... However, something was changing. Both Michael Jordan and his supporting cast were getting better and better. A young Scottie Pippen was beginning to show signs of what he was capable of. And in his third year, the wing was already selected for the all-star team while showing his enormous defensive potential. This time, the Bulls hoped the story would be different. As fate would have it, in 1991, the two franchises would meet again in the conference finals. The Pistons arrived with the confidence of knowing their opponent well, but the version of MJ they would face, however, was different. And the Bulls started by winning both of their home games, but made a real statement by winning the third on Detroit's home court. On the ropes, the Pistons needed to win the next game any way they could. The day was May 27th, 1991. Jordan knew that the game he was about to play was going to be the toughest of his life because it was also the most important game of his career. But he had learned a valuable lesson. Never again was MJ going to be intimidated by an extremely tough defense. The rules of the game had changed. His mentality had changed. And right out of the gate, he started to make that clear. On one of the first plays, Mike gets his first steal of the night. On an entry pass, Jordan steals the rock from Mark Aguirre, who had come to Detroit from Dallas just two years earlier. Aguirre was an elite scorer, one of the best players in Mavs history. I mean, those Pistons were stacked. But on that play, he couldn't do anything. After the steal, MJ brings the ball up, pulls up at mid-range, and he banks the shot after a nice little pump fake. Still, at the beginning of the game, the Pistons came out focused. Dumars started knocking down shots like this one after trying to recover from the poor play he'd shown in the first three games of the series. Unfortunately for him though, Jordan had other ideas. MJ rises from the left wing to shoot over Dumars and he knocks it down easily. I mean, it wasn't an easy shot, but we're talking about Michael Jordan. Still, he knew that just scoring wasn't going to get him past the Pistons. If he had learned anything from his losses to Larry Bird and the Celtics, it was that he had to get his teammates involved too. So by attracting defenders to the top of the key, Jordan began to generate good looks for the rest. On this play, he gets the assist after faking the shot and finding John Paxson in the corner who knocks it down from mid-range. Now remember, that night the Pistons did not want Mike going off. They immediately doubled him off the screen. But MJ makes the right play. Then Bill Cartwright comes right back to him for a dribble handoff for MJ to end up knocking down a three-pointer on a catch and shoot. In the first quarter, the Bulls show showed some superiority, but they were thirsty for much more blood. Chicago only led by six points. The Pistons were that defensive team that could suddenly leave you in an offensive drought, and Chicago needed to pull away to a safe distance to control the game. To do so, Phil Jackson would put a special emphasis on defense. Look how the Bulls come out in the second quarter. I mean, this Jordan and Pippen trap is something you don't even see in modern basketball, except in rare situations. And yeah, no way you can see that in today's game during 
the second quarter. Also, Isaiah Thomas was not playing his best game. The guard shot inefficiently, missing early shots like this one, which, however, Bill Lambeer manages to get the offensive rebound and put it back for two. Still, a bad day for Isaiah was a good day for many players. Shortly after, he knocks down a long two in the face of his defender with just seconds left on the shot clock. The Bulls' aggressiveness on defense was also showing on offense, with good drives by Mike that he managed to convert into free throws. Jordan realized how the Jordan rules that the Pistons had implemented to stop him actually worked, and so he was learning how to generate advantages through their holes. On this play, MJ draws two defenders but makes the right decision by finding Cliff Levingston in the low post who finishes with a nice little hook. And of course, his teammates were trying to find him whenever possible. On this play, Bill Cartwright grabs the offensive rebound and passes the ball to Jordan, who again, from the left wing, scores on a catch and shoot from mid-range. This time from the low post, MJ attacks Joe Dumars hard, only to step through the trap, drawing the foul. Shortly after, Michael throws a great pass quickly to Pippen, who finishes with a dunk in transition. Scotty loved to get out on the fast break, and he was scoring a lot of points thanks to MJ's vision. Meanwhile, Michael continued to show his best Larry Bird impersonation by becoming the complete player. This time again, he attracts two defenders to end up finding BJ Armstrong, who knocks down the mid-range. And the Bulls managed to win the second quarter by one point and increase the gap to seven points, an amount that was still not enough when facing a defensive juggernaut like Detroit. After the halftime adjustments, Phil Jackson knew that the Pistons would have corrected as many mistakes as possible heading into the second half, and the third quarter would be a tough one. But luckily, yeah, they basically had MJ to counter that. In one of the first plays, after halftime, Michael has to solve a complicated situation. In isolation, MJ shoots this fadeaway while moving to the top of the key, and the ball hits the rim multiple times before going in. You know what they say, shooters touch. Shortly after, there's a jump ball in the half court where the Bulls are defending. Michael takes advantage of it to catch the ball and get out in transition before any Pistons player getting an easy layup. But despite being able to score almost any time he wanted, MJ knew his teammates were responding that night too. This time, Mike gets the rock at the right wing. He moves toward the top of the key, where as always, he draws two defenders as the Jordan rules state. Well, actually this time it's three, but the important thing is that the guard finds Bill Cartwright who gives MJ his assist from the right baseline with his iconic form. But of course, you're playing against Detroit. They are the kings of defensive intensity. And this is a great example. Watch Jordan get tripped as he attempts to drive here. They couldn't foul him every time though. Shortly after, Mike gets the ball and the fakes the shot and uses his spectacular footwork to get an easy bucket. Then Scotty again demonstrates his tremendous ability to finish in transition after an outlet pass from Jordan. And then on one of the last plays of the third quarter, MJ attacks the rim but gets fouled, going to the free throw line because the Bulls are in the bonus. When the third quarter ends, the game is about to break. After winning the period 30 to 20, the point difference increased to 17. However, Jordan's huge game, not only as a scorer, but as an offensive playmaker was just sublime. Despite the lead though, MJ came out with the same intensity in the fourth quarter. 17 was not enough. He had to finish off the Pistons. And boy, he was mean. Look how he counters the slip screen with a quick crossover and a shot from mid range. He was still looking for his teammates though, operating from the top of the key or from the right wing and simplifying the game when the help defense approached him. On this play, MJ finds a cutting Pippen who finishes in the paint. This situation kept happening all the time, but Jordan just kept going back to his hot spot. After he finished it with a pass on the previous play, this time he fakes a shot, but only to end up making the pass that no one expects to find Horace Grant, another move that was very reminiscent of Larry Bird. After giving two baskets to Pippen in transition, this time it's the wing who returns the favor. Scotty finds Mike in transition who gets the easy dunk once again. And that play gave him the energy he needed to finish the game off. Once again, MJ gets the rock at the top of the key, raises for a pretty difficult shot, and on TV it looks like a foul, but the refs don't call it. However, after another friendly roll, the ball goes in. Honestly, God was on Jordan's side tonight. There's no doubt about it. Again, setting up the play from the top of the key, MJ decides this time to drive to his left and finish with the layup. He gets hit at the last moment and also gets the answer. 
and won. And by the time the game was over, it was pretty clear to everyone. The Detroit Pistons were no longer the nemesis of the Chicago Bulls. Michael Jordan had finally earned his place in the NBA Finals. And this is how Michael Jordan managed to remove the huge thorn he had stuck in his side for three seasons. The Pistons had become the kings of the East, winning the conference three times in a row. They seemed unbeatable, and they knew that as long as they were able to restrict MJ, their reign was in no danger. However, there came a time where the beast finally broke free of his chains. Chicago managed to win the NBA championship that same year after beating the LA Lakers in five games after losing the first one. And not only was it Mike's first championship and first finals MVP, it was also the first ring in Bulls history. But as we know, the best was yet to come. Chicago built a dynasty that would go on to win six NBA championships in an eight year span that made them pretty much the greatest team of all time. MJ's figure was idolized and mythologized to the point of being recognized as the GOAT. And the Pistons, well, they didn't advance from the first round of the playoffs for the next decade. It would not be until 2002 when the new generation of bad boys put them back on the map. Jordan didn't just win a playoff series. Jordan reset the blueprint that a franchise had built only because they knew they would never beat him again. All right, that's it for this one. Let us know what you thought down in the comments. Do us a favor and like, subscribe, and share the episode if you enjoyed it. And we'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.